migraine is kind of an extreme situation. You know, it's a sign that your body has gone way, way off from where it should be. And so the kind of body that tends to allow it to do that is a body that usually takes, usually you're going to have to do something forever to manage that body, which means. Hello, and welcome to the Herbs with Rosalie podcast, a show exploring how herbs heal as medicine, as food, and through nature connection. I'm your host, Rosalie de la Forêt. I created this YouTube channel to share trusted herbal wisdom so that you can get the best results when relying on herbs for your health. I love offering up practical knowledge to help you dive deeper into the world of medicinal plants and seasonal living. Each episode of the Herbs with Rosalie podcast is shared on YouTube as well as your favorite podcast app. Transcripts and recipes for each episode can be found at herbswithrosaliepodcast.com or through the link in the video description. Also in the video description, you'll find other helpful resources. For example, to get my best herbal tips, as well as fun bonuses, be sure to sign up for my weekly herbal newsletter. Okay, grab your cup of tea and let's dive in. I'm honored to bring you this interview with Carta Pritik Singh Khalsa about home remedies for migraines. KP was one of my first herbal teachers and he was my clinical mentor for several years. That means that as I was qualifying to be a registered herbalist with the American Herbalist Guild, I ran all my cases by him for feedback and advice. I can't stress how much I've learned from KP. I can tell you that many years ago, sitting in class intensives with KP, I never thought I would have a podcast or that I would even be hosting KP on it. I don't even think podcasts existed back then. It's truly an honor to have him on. One of the many things that I loved when studying with KP was how he was filled with so much experiential information and that he was so willing to share that. After an eight hour class, I would walk out of there feeling blissfully full after receiving this fire hose of practical, useful, and super insightful information. After listening to this conversation about home remedies for migraines, I think you'll feel the same. For those of you who don't know KP, he is an herbalist, nutritionist, yoga teacher, and educator who has been making holistic health approaches palatable to the modern mind for over 50 years. He was the first person to be professionally certified in both herbalism and Ayurveda in the U.S. He is the president emeritus of the American Herbalist Guild and director emeritus of the National Ayurvedic Medical Association. Well, welcome so much to the podcast, KP. It's truly an honor to have you. Well, thanks for having me, Rosalie. Definitely an honor to be here. Hmm. Well, it feels like I just hearing the sound of your voice and seeing you is just bringing back all these memories. I've spent many hours of, of class time with you, many hours on the phone, and I'm excited to to share your wisdom with uh, the Herbs with Rosalie podcast audience. Well, that's right. Let's see what we can uh, come up with. <laughs> well, I would love to start of hearing how you got started on the herbal path um, years ago. Yeah, well, this was a long time ago. It was the hippie time, and I actually had a condition that was causing me um, tremendous distress. I had pain every day. started when I was age 10, and there were a lot of disagreements about what the condition actually was, but the, the consensus was that I wouldn't make it past 40. So that was kind of the background to the whole thing. Now, when you're 10 years old and you hear something like that, it's very hard to process. And so I... Uh, really wasn't paying much attention to that, although I was hurting more and more at the time. And I, it was the hippie times. I got interested in all things alternative, as many people of my age uh, did. And we did such radical things as eating tofu. And, um, you know, we started to experiment with all these different new ideas that might make our lives better. And uh, I stumbled onto natural healing and in particular um, herbalism. And I was very fortunate to meet um, a cadre of, let's say, a dozen natural healing experts from previous generations. So these were people who were maybe in their 80s when I was still a teenager, and they were incredibly generous. You know, they'd been functioning uh, in the uh, in the shadows for their entire uh, career through through that dark ages of natural medicine in our culture. And the idea that some young folks wanted to know what they knew was very exciting for them. Now, that period didn't last very long because they were aged, and uh, they all died on us. But there were maybe a half a dozen 
of us, maybe a dozen who were interested in those kinds of things. And as we traveled around, we would meet with each other and sort of, you know, you show me what you know, I'll show you what I know. Uh, and studying with these uh, geniuses that so we could stand on their uh, their shoulders. And uh, gradually everything just continued to uh, expand. At the time, it was incredibly minimal. I mean, it, all these things were fascinating to us because it was all uh, brand new. But by comparison to what we have today, it was just nothing. Little tiny smidges of things here and there that we could uh, begin to use. But we began to use them. They began to work. We talked to each other. We talked to our mentors. We figured out how to make it better and better. And I've been involved ever since. So this is my 51st year doing that sort of thing. Five, one. Yeah. Wow. Well, that's um, the story of, you know, having some kind of major illness that Western medicine didn't really have a lot of answers for. I just, um, I've heard you tell this story before, but this time I was really struck that we were both given 40 as a, uh, as our kind of like life sentence that we wouldn't, wouldn't make it past wow. 40. So when we had that in common, you were so young to, you know, to take that in and, and really seek different things. And, and like you said, an entirely different world back there. You weren't you weren't Googling, you know, what herb is good for pain. You were out there, you know, learning from people and grabbing snippets here and there wherever you could. That's for sure. Now, the idea that I could treat my condition was completely not on my mind because I'd been told by an army of rheumatologists that it's untreatable. Just don't get into morphine too early because you're going to need a lot later. So really, that wasn't on my mind. I just found the whole thing to be fascinating, although that sort of wounded healer um, idea probably was there under the under the surface. And, um, you know, I it was in a yoga class, actually, where I was out of pain for about 15 minutes. And I said, well, if that there's one thing that can do it, there must be other things mm. that can do it and very slowly began put it together. But shortly thereafter, you know, maybe a couple, three years, I was out of pain completely. And now if you look at the my medical scans, no signs of that disease are there anymore. And I'm considerably past 40. I know you haven't made it to 40 yet, but I'm oh, uh, I have, but thank you for saying otherwise. <laughs> yeah. I'm considerably past. Uh, so yeah, so far so good. Yeah. Well, KP, usually on the podcast I have people choose an herb and we talk about that one herb. And when I asked you to be on the show, I was just already thinking, you know, I just want to talk about whatever KP wants to talk about because you have so much wisdom and I want to hear, you know, like what's fresh and interesting to you. And you came up with migraines. So I'm excited to hear what you have to share about migraines. Well, sure. We could talk about this for, you know, all day or longer, really. <laughs> I really want to emphasize that herbal medicine has... Uh, endured a renaissance now for about the last 50 years. It was completely dead for about 70 years in the United States, except for those very few people I was uh, talking about. But we put all that effort into putting it together, people like you and various others in our community. So now we have schools, textbooks, experienced teachers, and we have all that information put together. So if you would have asked me 20 years ago, you know, what we could do for migraines, I would say pretty tough. There's not much. Now I can say absolutely that anybody experiencing migraines should expect their migraines to not only be able to be suppressed, but to be cured. We know what we're doing. We do it um, uh, many, many times a day. My specialty is neurology. And so I do this uh, every single day and I expect every case to be uh, resolved. There might be a few oddball situations where that doesn't happen, but that's my expectation. So we can figure out why a person is having migraines. We can suppress them so that the last one you had should be the last one you ever had. And then we can work toward uh, healing the underlying problem so that you don't continue to have them. Mm. Now, I know there's a common saying in herbalism, like a headache isn't a headache isn't a headache, meaning that oftentimes in Western medicine, if you have a headache, you take ibuprofen. It's just kind of, you know, you have this, you have that. But in herbalism, we want to know more about that particular headache. I'm guessing that the same is true for migraines, which you could perhaps call a type of headache, and that there's not just one type of migraine. Yeah, absolutely. One of the things that we need to mention here is that migraines are a neurological phenomenon. And for many people, they do result in a headache. So the classic migraine, where the pain is on one side, it starts with a prodrome about 20 minutes before the headache comes, you know, it's coming, you see sparkly lights, things like that then it lasts from four to eight hours, we know that that's actually a minority of what today we would think of as migraines. Migraines are essentially seizures. 
epilepsy is essentially a migraine, you could say, or they're all seizure types. So on one end of the spectrum is classic epilepsy. On the other end of the spectrum is a classic migraine. There's a whole bunch of gray area uh, in the middle that we can treat. And it turns out that now uh, many uh, migraine specialists are using anti-seizure drugs and getting great results with migraine. And the opposite is also true. So it's one big spectrum. And uh, we can treat the underlying physiology, which is what you were saying. People are different. So there's no particular connection necessarily with the type of experience a person has and what's going wrong inside their body. It's their nervous system that we need to fix in the long run. Most migraines can be suppressed with pretty much the same things. And then most migraine and epilepsy can be treated, again, with more or less the same things. So when someone comes to see you and that's their main complaint is that they have a migraine, where, what are you first thinking? What questions are you first asking? Well, I want to find out about a whole bunch of physiological things happening in their body. Physiological things like their sleep, their bowel movements, their digestion, when they have energy during the day, if they do, and when they don't, uh, do they feel hot or cold? How long does it take food to go through their digestive tract? And I'm looking for basic underlying physiological functions, like whether or not their body is overactive, is it burning too many calories for their benefit and just wasting that heat? Or is it unable to burn enough calories to be able to run their body properly? And now they're hypo functioning, uh, not functioning as well as they could. So migraine, what we know of as migraine today, and that wide spectrum of things could be caused in just about any kind of a person. So there are sort of, you know, heavy, wet uh, migraines and um, hot migraines and cold and dry migraines. But the vast majority of people have a cold and dry physiology. That is, their body is hypofunctioning. It's not burning the calories it needs to run its metabolism on a daily basis. People may not feel objectively cold, but usually they do. And they're not necessarily cold with a thermometer, but everything is just running slowly, pulse circulation, uh, food through the digestive tract. These people usually have anxiety and insomnia uh, as well. And so most of the time we're looking to warm them up and lubricate them as our fundamental uh, strategy. Usually though, I wanna treat the symptom of the migraines. I wanna use something that if they take it every day consistently, they will never have a migraine. They'll never drop off that cliff and have those sparkly lights and that, and that pain so that they can feel comfortable that things are going to happen properly and they're in the right place and we can get good results. Now, having people take those suppressive herbal medicines every day, probably not the best idea because we didn't get to that underlying cold and dry physiology, constipation, anxiety kind of issues. So we want to then go back and handle those issues. To say a word, by the way, about how people experience migraines, the classic hemicranial or one side of the head pain that lasts 48 hours. Um, is what we think of as a migraine, but it can be just about anything. People can f smell a funny smell. Um, they can see the sparkly lights. Sometimes that's all that happens. Um, maybe they feel a tingling in, in one arm or they have any kind of sensory input that's different and unusual. In migraine, people usually don't lose consciousness. In epilepsy, they usually do lose consciousness. But again, those two terms are starting to become obsolete because it's this whole spectrum of neurological dysfunction or neuronal instability uh, in the brain. So all of those things are in the same spectrum. If it happens with a trigger phenomenon, that is normal, you don't have it, but something happens to cause your arm to tingle and it's the same every time, that's a migraine just as much as the typical migraine. And then if we do the things we need to stabilize the nervous system, those that stops happening. Hmm. I want to I want to go back to you what you said about your approach KP because I think this is so brilliant and it reminded me of just why I love studying with you so much is that you have just to simplify kind of this like two-handed approach where you're doing something um in we could say maybe intense but something that's very specifically suppressing the symptoms so that the person is not experiencing those symptoms or more comfortable while also working, you know, for the underlying physiology. And I remember that was your approach to say insomnia. You, you know, you weren't the person who was like, okay, this person has 10 things we need to work on over the next couple of months. So we're just going to let them have insomnia for a couple of months. 
while we work on those things and ultimately hopefully they'll get some sleep one day you were very much like no this person needs sleep now so we're gonna we're gonna get them to sleep now while working on those things it's a very yeah. clever approach and i just think it's also very compassionate you know for it's holistic and also compassionate for the people Sure. Uh, people are miserable with these things. And very often they do see practitioners who are locked into a particular uh, philosophy of we always treat the root first. That's the most efficient way to do it. Uh, the root might have 12 branches coming off of it. And they have, you know, as you said, all these 10 things to uh, to work on. But if they're not comfortable and they can't make it through the day and sleep, in fact, is one of the most important things. If people aren't sleeping, they're the most uh, uncomfortable, and it's the thing that is the most likely to help them heal uh, anyway. So we might as well get them to sleep. Mm -hmm. Well, I know that you probably don't have a like a one size fits all package when it comes to migraines, but I'm, I'm curious, what are some herbs that you commonly call on? Oh, sure. We can talk about a few that are likely to work for most people. So we mentioned that uh, migraine is very, it's most often comorbid with anxiety, insomnia, mm -hmm and constipation. So some of those things can be treated fairly quickly. Usually we can find something that is going to work for their anxiety and insomnia. And usually it'll be an herb, you know, maybe it's a valerian that they take during the day that helps them with, takes the edge off anxiety and then a higher dose at bedtime for insomnia. And then we all know many things to, to be used temporarily for constipation. Getting insomnia and constipation handled fairly quickly make, is a huge difference in just the way people feel overall they maybe have never been constipated. I just talking to a person yesterday who said that never, she's never experienced not being constipated. She has a bowel movement every five days. She can't get any attention with her medical doctors about that. And that's just who she is and what she's used to. So we'll work on that and get that down to, um, you know, minimum uh, one per day. So people have, as a background, these kinds of things we're talking about, a cold, dry, unlubricated, hypofunctioning, uh, physiology, uh, there are trigger factors in the case of both epilepsy and migraine. We're talking about migraine. So things that will generate uh, a migraine. And there are dozens and dozens of them. And it depends on the particular person, which things they're sensitive to. So they have this brain that's inherently not very stable. It has difficulty maintaining its own uh, homeostasis. And then there are things that pile on and it's different for everyone. So it can be staying up late at night. Again, not getting the, the sleep that's necessary. It could be certain foods. It can be climate conditions like uh, air pressure and uh, uh, temperature, so many things. Most people have dozens of sensitivities and uh, typically it takes about three hurt happening at the same time. So they eat chocolate, they don't get a migraine. They eat eggplant, they don't get a migraine. Uh, the barometric pressure goes up, they don't get a migraine. But when all those three things happen in the same day, the migraine is triggered. So that unstable physiology creates this uh, neuronal instability and they fall off the cliff. The, the brain is able to understand that that's happened and re-regulate itself. It just takes a while uh, to do that. So this is caused by uh, the brain sending too much blood into the brain and then the brain says whoa too much blood and then vasoconstricting uh and now the brain doesn't have enough blood there are 20 good theories about really what the bottom line cause of migraine is and they all make good sense but we don't have one sort of smoking gun uh, most people feel like it's either the vasodilation or the vasoconstriction well that's great but that doesn't help much because those are opposites so what do we do what we have to do is rely on things that we've discovered over time that will work well, handle that particular uh, situation. So the first one we can talk about is uh, ginger, simple ginger. It seems like something that shouldn't be that dramatic, but it's very good to abort a migraine. So during the prodrome, those 20 minutes or so of feeling like uh, uh, funny and that the pain is going to start, that's the time to hit it. I usually recommend two heaping tablespoons of ginger, stir that into a glass of water, drink that down. Within about five minutes, the whole episode begins to wind down. Um, it may start try to restart itself again in, let's say, another four hours. If it does, you just do the same thing again. Most of the time it won't. And usually that'll just stop it immediately, and the person can just go right back to doing what they were, what they were doing. This has happened occasionally in class where a student has said that they're you know, they, they look green and we say, what's going on? So a margarine starting and 
direct them to the ginger in half an hour, they're back at their, their desk in the classroom. So that's the one thing that we know that will abort a migraine. There are a few other ideas on the horizon that we're working with that might be good for that, but that one is virtually 100% effective. I want to attest to that because I this is a KPism that I learned from you many years ago and all my years of clinical practice, I have recommended it so many times. And wow, does it work? And wow, are people amazed? I mean, it works so well. And after, you know, suffering for so long, getting these migraines and then they find out, you know, ginger, I think, you know, a couple people, it, it is such a common herb and they're just like, really, you really, yes, I really think it's going to help. And it really does. So, you know, it's a great it's one. Not, that's right. It's not that exotic, but use it the right time in the right way in the right dose. It just knots it. <clears throat> that doesn't solve the underlying problem. Now, some people, you know, if they get one migraine a year, they feel like, okay, I have the ginger. Why, why do we need to deal with it? The migraine is a sign of underlying problems. So just to say, okay, the migraine, I have something I can use if it's happening, doesn't get to the underlying root of the problem. So we want to encourage them to work on their usually cold and dry, unlubricated physiology with all those issues we talked about. Now, a couple other things we might consider is uh, salicylates. That's willow bark and meadowsweet, things like that. Those usually don't work very well, but in some cases, you know, they're on the B list. They might work for some people. And then the opiates, which the two main ones that I would mention would be a poppy seed and the Chinese herb Corydalis. Both of those are kind of medium strength opioids that sometimes will be enough to suppress the migraine at the time. Once the migraine gets rolling, there's usually very little other than some newer drugs that can work for that. And so what are some kind of typical recommendations for that underlying cause? Well, first, let's talk a little bit about prevention. So we talked about aborting the migraine. I'm going to mention three herbs here that all work very, very well. The first two are virtually 100%, and that's feverfew. Feverfew is a preventive. It doesn't stop the underlying problems, but we don't know how it works. There's no, there's a little bit of science on the fact that it does work, but none about how it works. So feverfew, uh, you take the amount that when you take it every day consistently, you never have another migraine. The dose range is huge there. So it can be anywhere from, let's say, 250 milligrams up to eight grams. I've only had one client that it required eight grams to prevent that but you start with let's say half a gram if that works so if, if you but you're still having migraines then increase by half a gram every two or three days and um, once you're up to the amount where as long as you take it you never have another migraine then that's what you want feverfew is an herb that's a little bit persnickety in the way it likes to be handled there's nothing special that you have to do with it but you just have to grow it cut it dry it with some care. So high quality companies that are making fever few would make good fever few and that should be fine, but you just can't mow it down like hay and uh, expect it to continue to work a little bit delicate in how it should be prepared. Uh, the other, the next one is a butter burr, which was the main herb used for pain in Europe in the middle ages. And this will be available in specialized preparations, standardized extracts. That's what we're going to get. That will be available. And uh, same thing take the amount that once you get up to that amount, uh, you never have another migraine. Both of those are about 100%, but there's two where if you start with one and it doesn't work, you can try the other one. The issue usually is dose. Most people who don't have good success, it's because they didn't just take enough and they need to bump the dose up just a little bit. Let me throw in one more, and that's peony. Peony was a favorite of Hippocrates, and pe peony used to grow all the way across uh, Eurasia. Today, it's not used in Western herbalism, but you'll find it in Chinese herbalism. Peony has a particular connection with the liver and um, at least Ayurveda and Chinese medicine very much have a story about migraine and how that happens that involves the liver. So it's not surprising that peony would be involved. That one is probably not 100%, it's more like 60%. And the dose there typically is about eight grams and you could take that each day and you just bump up the dose until you never have another migraine. That's less reliable, but that's on the B list if some reason the other two don't work or are not available. All right, so what was our next uh, area? So we've done prevention, we've done aborting of migraine, you feel it coming on. Now it's the those under, those, those root causes. Right, so for most people, it's that issue of a cold and dry physiology. And so we have to examine everything about 
why their body is running that way. It's almost always genetic. And we have to encourage people to uh, live a life and eat a diet that warms them up, warming digestive herbs, warming circulatory herbs, things that lubricate the tissue like demulcents and various uh, oils, and uh, make sure they get enough sleep and that they have their uh, bowel movement, minimum one bowel movement a day. We just have to go back and neutralize all that cold, dry stuff. And usually that takes typically two or three years. And then once that's accomplished, they probably can pull back on their preventive remedies and discover that they're not having the migraines anymore. We've handled the underlying issue. One significant factor here is uh, magnesium deficiency. So migraine is, is almost a specific for magnesium deficiency. And we know that uh, 95%, 97%, something like that of our population is magnesium deficient. Uh, so we can either investigate that and find a sophisticated test to test for magnesium, or we can just go ahead and try it. When you've got something that 97% people are deficient in, it's pretty likely that you're that your client is going to be that. So you can just try it. Anyway, we bring magnesium up to what we call bowel tolerance. Magnesium draws water into the gut, liquefies the stool and helps soften up and exit uh, comfortably. And so bowel tolerance is the maximum amount of magnesium that you can take that doesn't cause discomfort in terms of the stool, that you're not going to have an accident. And uh, you continue that for quite some time. And then eventually, six to nine months later, uh, you can do a test for magnesium and figure out where you are and adjust it as needed. So that sometimes that will just completely solve the problem right there. Some people's migraines are strictly because of magnesium deficiency. You get that handled and, um, you know, it's done. A couple of others that we could consider, uh, the herb go cola, which is used in all the big three systems. And that's probably the best nerve herb in the world. I just use it every single day with people. It's mild and slow acting though. So we have to get the dose up and use it very consistently over time to help re-regulate and nourish the nervous system. Go to cola. We use the above ground portion. So it's a little tiny plant in the parsley family. And you can use that as tea. It's quite edible. You could use it as food. You can, you know, if you can get it fresh, which we don't have here, you could use it like spinach in stir fries or something. But otherwise, probably tea is going to be the way to go. And the dose could be, let's say, 30 grams of the gota cola that then you cook into tea, drink that. And that dose then taken over six months or so helps to rejuvenate, heal the nervous system. So that's a, a, a remedy to cure the underlying problem in their nervous system, if we could say that. The other one is a Chinese herb called Bajie. It's uh, B-A-I and then Z-H-I. This is an angelica. Many of your listeners are familiar with uh, European angelica, I'm sure. So this is angelica anomala. They're angelica spread all over Eurasia, and they're used in all the uh, herbal systems, certainly highlighted in uh, Western Ayurveda and Chinese medicine. So all these angelicas are very smooth, comfortable, easy, slow blood movers, as opposed to using heat to move the blood like ginger or cayenne. These angelicas are very easy on the body and a slow movement, and they all have a, a tropism or a place where they concentrate. So Bajie is oriented toward the head. So it brings that blood slowly, comfortably, easily up into the head and then back down out of the head. So that energy that was concentrated in the head um, gets relieved. It's probably very similar to what ginger does, and ginger is just more on the spot, whereas the bajir you're using ongoing to manage that. Uh, that's the number one herb in Chinese medicine to treat migraine for that, that reason. Typical dose there is about um, 10 grams a day. It would be decocted in Chinese medicine. You could take it in capsules or powder if you wanted. Um, I, I would put bajir on, you know, like the B list or even the C list. It is the number one remedy in Chinese medicine for this problem, energy stuck in the head. And Chinese medicine doesn't like those hot herbs that you, you know, blast the circulation through. We want to nudge it through and encourage it. Uh, but I just haven't seen it perform that well for migraines in particular. Uh, you could certainly try it. So we've talked about, you know, 10 herbs or something by now already. Mm -hmm. And all those are things that one could experiment 
with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So with the, with everyone has their own healing journey, of course, but what I'm hearing from you is when you work with people, you like to see immediate results in terms of just a improved quality of life, less migraine symptoms. Um, but what is, is there somewhat of a typical, like from start to finish or not that there ever is a finish, but what is that kind of like that timeline generally look like? A uh, couple of years, probably, for the average person who's experiencing migraines. And um, to mention again that migraine doesn't have to be the aura and then the half of the head uh, horrible pain. It's all this kind of stuff. It's all the same issue. The brain can't maintain its own homeostasis. So uh, usually we can stop the migraines immediately. Person might have, you know, another one in a couple of days or something after we get started. But once we get rolling, the migraine should be suppressed. That should happen more or less immediately. So it depends on how often they have them. You know, if they're only having a migraine once every six months, it takes us a while to to drill down into the proper uh, procedure. But most people are having them more often than that. And so then you can adjust the the preventive remedies pretty quickly. Then the other underlying issues, you know, a year or two probably to get all that handled, adjust their diet, warm up the, their physiology. So people who are a little bit, a migraine is kind of an extreme situation. You know, it's a sign that your body has gone way, way off from where it should be. And so the kind of body that tends to allow it to do that is a body that usually takes, usually you're going to have to do something forever to manage that body, which means mild warming remedies in the in the diet, a mildly warming uh, diet, no cold foods, you know, refrigerated salads, that kind of thing. Um, things that promote proper movement in the digestive tract, that's just going to have to be the new way of life. And uh, going to bed at the same time every night, doing whatever you have to do to stay asleep all night, getting up at the same time, regularity and discipline, which typically people with migraines are not good with regularity and discipline. They're very often artists and um, they like to, uh, you know, stay up all night painting and then sleep where they fall and then get up again in the morning. All of that, not so good for their nervous system. Mm -hmm. I, I love how practical what you've shared is because I think for someone mildly interested in herbalism, their question might be, you know, what is the natural remedy for migraines or, you know, what herb do I take for migraines? And what I'm hearing from you is, um, which has always been what I've heard from you, is that there's different ways of thinking about it, short-term results, long-term results, working on both. But, and then it's these variety of herbs that could work. But what you've shared in such a succinct amount of time is that it's not even just that herb, but the quality of that herb, like for the case of feverfew, it's very important to get a certain quality of herb. And something that I deeply appreciate about your sharing is the dosage too, because that is something, you know, I grew up in herbalism learning from you. And so dosage was really nailed in early on, but that is something that I continue to see is such a, um, I don't know, just a missed point, especially in Western herbalism of just, you know, having these very small dosages that, and then also this one size fits all dosage. And, you know, as you shared it, there's a starting point and then there's finding out what works for the ind individual. So there, just the one herb for migraine isn't what we're going for, but there is, um, there are answers out there and looking at, you know, within all of these practical things, the herb, the dosage, the person. Well, Rosalie, that makes two of us now that are concerned about dose. <laughs> so we'll see what happens in the future. Uh, people like the idea that herbalism is simple and easy and you can just take one little bit, 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 and uh, the problem is handled and um, they often are just continuing to seek that after many failures with that not working and, but it should work, you know, but it doesn't, we're not surrounded by people where we see it working like we would be in a traditional culture. And so we don't see our aunties and siblings and neighbors taking these things in the way that, that really works. So we're really struggling to figure out, uh, you know, how to do it. I know that you're on a crusade against vending machine herbalism. I've heard that many times from you and uh, John Gallagher. And uh, yeah, that's exactly right. I, just today, I was teaching an advanced class in, I was a guest speaker in a, another professional's class teaching uh, professional clinical level herbalism. And all the questions were about what's the best herb for X, Y, Z. And it's like that that misses the, uh, the, the question altogether. But even at that level, people just can't resist that. You mm -hmm. go to the medical doctor's office and really they're not 
thinking what's the best herb either or what's the best drug because they have 12 drugs they could consider and they all work a little bit differently. There is no best herb or best drug for, you know, disease X. It depends on all those other factors. Yeah, so true. Well, is there anything else about migraines you'd like to share before we move on, KP? Let me mention a little bit about this whole liver thing. So there's a story, a metaphor, an understanding in both Chinese medicine and um, Ayurveda today, and it was there in Western herbalism in Hippocrates' uh, time. Hippocrates said that uh, peony softens and comforts the liver. But the idea from an energy point of view is that the liver is a big energy backstop. It's a really weird situation. It's the only place in the body where veins get smaller as they're going back up toward the heart. So they, the, these big veins that come from the digestive tract, the portal vein, namely, breaks down into very small capillaries in the liver and then merges back together into a big vein that comes out and goes up and goes to the heart. It's a recipe for disaster because the way we're built is that our liver is jammed up under the right side of our rib cage. Everything is stuffed up in there. And then if we're eating things that we can't digest very well, a lot of stuff is coming up through that vein into the liver, the liver gets stagnant or overwhelmed or toxic or however we want to talk about it. The energy can't be contained in the liver properly and it, it bursts out. It gets lost sometimes. The liver is a hot organ. Very often that energy that comes out is hot. So in Chinese medicine, that would be called liver fire rising or some other similar uh, name for that. And so these migraines, uh, can be hot or cold. The one, what we talk about as a classic migraine is typically cold, that perspective that I've been talking about the, uh, uh, the whole time. But many of these uh, remedies focus on uh, the liver, like the peony or other things. So just being aware that the liver is the thing that for most of us, for most conditions, is the thing that, that slows down the process. You're just grinding away on getting the liver unstuck for month after month while you're looking for the cure uh, for these things. So we want to be aware of uh, taking good care of our liver and uh, helping helping it to not contribute to these head problems. Thank you for that. Well, Kippy, are there any projects that you're working on these days? Got anything new under your belt? Oh, you know, mainly I'm uh, teaching and I'm teaching at every level from beginner to intermediate to uh, professional. Uh, what I really like to do, of course, is treat is to teach more advanced classes. I don't know where your audience is in that, uh, you know, in that spectrum, but I've been doing this for a long time. And so I'm interested in working with the people at, um, you know, sort of that higher level of more uh, experience and also to talk about all these kinds of things like epilepsy and migraine that now we can do very well with. We're starting to do very well with Parkinson's disease, for for example, and some of these things that are tough to treat. And we're now finally making some of those uh, some of those breakthroughs. So herbal medicine is really at a place where uh, we're doing some remarkable uh, kinds of things. So I'm excited about a lot of a lot of those things. Otherwise, it's uh, you know just kind of the usual. Uh, teaching clients and, you know, sun goes up, sun goes down. <laughs> and you are seeing clients right now. I am. Yeah. yeah. And um, I am subscribed to your newsletter as I have been for many years. And I know you're, you are teaching all the time and special topics as well. So I recommend that folks get on your newsletter uh, so they can hear about all of those class opportunities as well. Well, before we go, I have one last question for you. And this is a question I'm asking everybody in season five of the podcast. Uh, we may have already answered it, but the question is, in what ways do you feel like herbalism is misunderstood by the general public? I think a lot of people think that herbalism is like Heidi in the Alps. You live with your grandfather in a, in a cabin, pick herbs out in the, in the meadows and dry them. Uh, in the rafters. And there are some people that practice like that. But really what we're talking about is sophisticated clinical herbalism. And most clinical herbalists are not wild crafters. Uh, you know, maybe, you know, a little bit here and there, but those are two separate professions. That's number one. Um, also, the misunderstand, it's, it's cognitive dissonance that people are willing to think of herbalism as being powerful and dangerous, and yet uh, mild and ineffective. 
And all both of those are true at some level, but we're trying to figure out and educate people about what the benefits are of herbal medicine at what level. So people are asking uh, the advice of health food store clerks and just getting nonsense back. So we have to get all this uh, straightened out. And I think it's just the, where do I apply what is the, the biggest misunderstanding. People are interested, but they're confused and um, they expect things to be mm, comfortable in the sense that nothing is ever going to taste bad and that sort of thing. That's something that we have to get over. So uh, yeah, a lot of these things that slowly we have to educate people about, we'll see where it all goes. Yeah. Well, you have been doing an excellent job of teaching that for many years now, and I'm certainly um, continue to learn from you. And I'm so glad to have you here on the podcast. I really appreciate you taking the time to do it. Yeah. Thanks for having me, uh, Rosalie. And uh, good day to all of you out there in podcast land. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to click the link in the video description to get free access to the handout about migraines from KP. Also available are the complete show notes, including the transcript. You can find KP at internationalintegrative.com where you can find his online classes and long distance consultations. If you enjoyed this interview, then before you go, be sure to click the subscribe button so you'll be the first to get my new videos, including interviews like this. I'd also love to hear your comments about this interview with KP and migraines. I deeply believe that this world needs more herbalists and plant-centered folks. I'm so glad that you're here as part of this herbal community. Have a beautiful day.